Hi, you're listening to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast, hosted by the Fairwinds Crew. I'm Maggie Gunderson, and today I'm joined by Caroline Phillips, Fairwinds Program Administrator, Toby Aronson, our media producer, and Chief Engineer Arnie Gunderson. Welcome to the show. Today is our final installment of Arnie's Japan Speaking Tour. We, the Fairwinds crew, will hear Arnie's reflections on his trip to Japan and discuss comments by Japan's Prime Minister Abe, recent articles about the ongoing tragedy at Fukushima Daiichi, and Japanese court orders to halt operating nuclear reactors. Arnie, could you begin by talking to us about your reflections on the trip? Hi, everybody. It's nice to be in the same room instead of half a world away. Yeah, I, I've been reflecting a lot over the last week and a half about uh, what the trip meant to me personally and uh, what I learned and what Fairwinds learned and what we all can learn from that experience. Uh, you know, the first thing is people are nice everywhere. Uh, the, the people I met on the trip and who hosted me were just wonderful human beings and terribly concerned about their country and concerned about their children and uh, welcomed Fairwinds with open heart. Uh, it was really, really special to see so much uh, outpouring of grace and, and, in fact, love. It was really wonderful. The second thing is the inhumanity of the Japanese government, the Japanese utilities, and the Japanese banks toward their own population. Uh, I'm just appalled at how the uh, power structure in Japan is ignoring what its people want and basically ramming nukes down, uh, down the throat of their population. Let's cut to a quote directly from Prime Minister Abe speaking before the Olympics Committee in 2013, and let's listen to what he says about where the country's at at that time. Japan has its narrative. The narrative is from devastation to revitalization. It is about the disasters we endured, the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear failure. But it is also about the revitalization, the bridge between the two was compassion, courage, and calmness. The English was potentially a little unclear, so I'll just read the quote quick. And it says, Japan has its narrative. The narrative is from devastation to revitalization. It is about the disasters we've endured, the earthquake, the tsunami, and nuclear failure. But it is also about the revitalization. The bridge between the two was compassion, courage, and calmness. Arnie, can you kind of clue us into what Abe's saying here? Yeah, I think there's a, a another quote that sort of goes along with that. Uh, it was all about getting the Olympic Games back uh, a year or two after the nuclear disaster at Fukushima. His other quote was to the Olympic Committee, Some may have concerns about Fukushima. Let me assure you, the situation is under control. You know, and as I look at all these uh, news stories that came out in this last week with the fifth anniversary of the disaster, you know, Abe was wrong, and we all knew he was wrong. The situation wasn't in control in 2012, 2013, and here we are, 2016, and the situation still isn't in control. It's five years after Fukushima, and there have been a lot of commentary and a lot of various news articles talking about Fukushima and quoting Abe. Recently, he said, according to ABC News, Our country is a resource-poor nation, and in order to secure energy supply while considering the economic efficiency and climate change problems, nuclear power is indispensable, Prime Minister Abe said. And this comment he made is coming a day after Japanese courts ordered the shutdown of two nuclear reactors that were previously declared safe under post-disaster safety rules. So it, it seems clear that Abe is pushing for this nuclear restart, doesn't want a change of policy. But it, it sounds like from that, Arnie, that even within the Japanese court system, there is and there's good reason for pause. There's good reason to look at these nuclear reactors and say, hey, wait a minute, is this really ready to go? What is your take on that, having just been in Japan? 
Yeah, you know, the deck is stacked against the Japanese people. The banks control the diet, which is their parliament, as do the 10 big utilities. And um, they want to get their asset performing again. Their assets are uh, 40-some-odd nukes that are permanently shut down right now. So they want, their, they want their money flowing, and the only way to get their money flowing is to get the electricity flowing. You know, you talk about global warming and how to prevent it. And, uh, you know, Fukushima showed us that you can, one, destroy the fabric of a country overnight, and two, you can lose all your nuclear generation for as long as five years with a one disaster. You know, I think that really drives the issue back to renewables. And Japan's not resource poor. I mean, they've got, uh, you know, they've got lots of wind, they've got lots of sun, and, uh, and they've got geothermal. So I, I think a concerted effort by the Japanese over the last five years, could have weaned themselves from this uh, nuclear bind that Abe has put them into. I remember, Arnie, that that was something you and Mark Pendergrast, an author from Colchester, Vermont, who wrote Mirror, Mirror and Japan's Tipping Point, discussed because right after the disaster and, and the triple meltdown, it was clear that Japan had a chance to move on to wave action, to move on to wind, to move on to solar, and, and they were being encouraged around the world. What's interesting to me is that Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel, who is a physicist by training, decided to make this change for Germany because the risk of nuclear power is too great. I know that in your private meetings with former Prime Minister Nero Khan, he made mention about his change from being pro-nuclear to becoming against nuclear power because the risk for health impact and financial devastation is way too great. Can you speak to that? Yeah, one of the one of the stories out this week was Nero Khan was being uh, briefed, and he talked about how. He had the head of what we would call the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the, the METI, in to, uh, to discuss what was going on in Fukushima. And the, the, this is the head regulator of the nuclear industry, and he didn't know anything. And he admitted to Abe that he wasn't an engineer, that he was an economics major. Economics has been driving the nuclear industry in Japan before the disaster at Daiichi. And, you know, since Prime Minister Abe's been elected, he's stacking the deck again with regulators with a pro-nuclear uh, bent. Uh, you know, it's frustrating to see essentially every woman in the country and more than half of the men uh, disagreeing with their own government and still making no, uh, no progress. You know, let me just look at, read a couple of headlines. Uh, these are just the headlines, and we have these things posted on the site. You know, so here's you remember back in 2013, Abe saying, uh, "Let me assure you, the situation's under control." Well, last week Reuters said, "Fukushima Ground Zero, no place for man or robot." Scientific American. Crippled Fukushima reactors are still a danger. Five years after, and the New York Times. Fukushima keeps fighting radioactive tide five years after disaster. I mean, these are not uh, you know left wing uh, news stories. These are our, our mainstream media has finally come over to realize that what Abe said to get the Olympics back in uh, 2012 was a marketing ploy, and uh, that in fact uh, the situation in Fukushima is uh, is not safe now, and it wasn't safe then. Just a, another question regarding the media sources. Uh, you mentioned that we have Scientific American, New York Times, ABC News at the fifth year mark here coming out and saying that, you know, this is still an issue, whether it's from cancers to contamination to, you know, people displacement. This is still a huge problem. As far as media in Japan goes from your trip over there, you know, what sense do you get of the message and the, the sort of uh, rhetoric people are being fed by media sources in Japan? Yeah, I think they still feel pressure under that State Secrets Act. You know, nobody wants to uh, push too hard against the Abe administration. As a matter of fact, one of Abe's prime key ministers came out and said twice now that if the um, media is not not good to the administration, basically, if the media doesn't uh, say what the administration wants them to say, 
they're going to pull their licenses. So, you know, the pressure is on the media in Japan to whistle the tune that the Abe administration wants them to whistle. Well, in line with that, I've mentioned earlier that there was a district court order to stop the restart of two reactors in Japan that have been very questioned, highly questioned by the public. The Kenzai Electric Power Company's Takahama nuclear power plant in the Fukui Prefecture. I think it's reactors three and four, I believe. And in line with this, this district court pointed out that not only are these risks bad for Japan, but these risks have a worldwide effect. And going hand in hand with that, the district court pointed out, and this is a direct quote, the Japanese public who watched the disaster unfold at the Fukushima number one plant understood the overwhelming scope of the damages caused by the accident, as well as the great confusion that arose during the evacuation process. Yet both the government and electric utilities are working in tandem to restart reactors as if they'd forgotten what happened five years ago. And that speaks volumes, at least to me, that a Japanese district court is pointing this out, which is so in line with the, with what you're saying. The general public of Japan has huge reason to be concerned about nuclear restart. They are concerned And it seems so apparent when reading this news that the government and electric utilities, they really are brushing over this whole saga, just trying to put a nice sort of veil over it. Thanks, Caroline, for elaborating on that. What really struck me is that one of the articles on the Japanese court orders was an editorial from the Japanese paper Asahi Shimbum. And it said, despite utilities' attempts, nuclear safety myth can never be revived. And to have more than 70% of the people standing up and demonstrating consistently, which has not been covered in the media, in rallies, in marches, in papers, in active citizens groups, adding that to the newspapers, pushing back against the Abe regime, which has this paramilitary stance, I think is heartening to see press and individuals taking a stand even though they're being threatened with jail. Yeah, you know, the one thing I learned when I was in the resettlement communities is that they've all been told that there will be no resettlement communities by the time the Olympics start. The plan is to move people back into their homes in the contaminated areas or to move them somewhere else in Japan to permanent homes. And that all of these uh, essentially trailer parks for the resettlement of 160,000 people will be gone. Uh, Why? So Japan can show the world that the disaster is behind them. And it's anything but. I was devastated when I saw some of the pictures that you took in Japan, Arnie. When I have looked at Japan's pictures from all my other friends and colleagues who have traveled there and just the beauty and the peacefulness and the serenity of the gardens. Even in Tokyo, people have gardens they can walk to and areas they can walk along waterways to to have a chance for peace and reflection. And these barracks, and that's all they are, these temporary housings just look like military barracks on bare pavement is horrific for the people who have been stuck there. And I was surprised at one of your inquiries on one of our earlier podcasts when you met with the women in, who had been evacuated from Fukushima Prefecture, and no one in the government had come to their community of 62 people in the five years to tell them about radiation, what to look for, what to look for in, in terms of radiation poisoning symptoms. So and now to hide the radiation, extensive radiation that's there and redepositing in the already cleaned areas from snowmelt and flooding and rain and say it's okay and send everyone back is a death sentence to all these families and, and children and grandchildren. Yeah, let me get back to the first thing I said about the inhumanity toward their own people. We had doctors tell us that they, uh, when they treated somebody for radiation illness, if they put radiation illness on the on the hospital forms, they were uh, 
the government refused to pay. So doctors were literally going out of business because they were doing their job and treating people. But the other thing I learned uh, on the last day of the trip um, uh, was that uh, there's a, a huge spike in the uh, in the death rates within uh, Fukushima Prefecture for young children compared to what it was in previous years. But that story's been stifled by the Japanese medical and government agencies. Nobody's publishing the, the data that the Japanese have been publishing for years leading up to the disaster. So um, where's the, where are the, the death data on Fukushima Prefecture? Um, then the answer is it hasn't been published because the Japanese government doesn't want it out there. You know, when you control the medical community, the epidemiological um, data that you need to prove a case is, um, is really, really difficult. I, I think Ferenc did a good job in the time we were over there getting the sample data with a group of scientists that, uh, that may affect uh, the way the world looks at the disaster. But the, the other half of that is you've got to get the doctors on board to report honestly what they're seeing. And uh, the medical community is uh, even more under the thumb of the Abe regime than is the press. It's very depressing. I uh, read a BBC article that was inspiring. It was about a group of mothers who have come together and taken the time to not only get a Geiger counter, but learn how to operate it, learn about Becquerel's and micro sieverts and sieverts. They've been working alongside uh, university professors to understand, and they now have a lab running. And there have been hundreds in this article I was reading, there have been hundreds of little pop-up community laboratories, but what sets them apart is that they can read both gamma and beta rays. And it's wonderful that the Japanese people have taken the initiative to try to find out these things because, like you said, the epidemiological studies are going to be close to near impossible to take place in the future because the data is so hidden, the data is so convoluted. And these women are really working hard to protect their children, to protect their community and their land. Uh, I, it was sweet. I, they even have opened a clinic now where they do have doctors that give free thyroid screenings to children. So it's it's a wonderful thing. It's admirable and courageous of these women. Yeah. The trust that people have for their government is tenuous, but was very strong in Japan before the disaster. But that bond of trust is, is totally breached now. And uh, it's wonderful that citizens came forward and did what the government should do. But again, the government should have done it, and nobody trusts them anymore. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and I want to let you know that Arnie and other scientists are working on uh, some really significant studies from samples that scientists have taken in Japan and sent to labs in Japan and in the U.S. Fairwinds will be participating in a report that will be issued on this, and we will keep you up to date. It takes time to do this testing, but as soon as it's ready, it will be publicized. We're very thankful for the support of all of our followers that enabled Arnie to make this trip and for the beautiful letters and emails we've received about the poignant stories we've been able to share with you. Caroline, Toby, Arnie, thanks for joining me today. This is Maggie Gunderson signing off, and we'll keep you informed. <laughs>